So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Now, the Sabbath school lesson this morning was on the story of Joseph. And uh, I'll have to say, well, it's not a happy coincidence, is it? Holy Spirit works these things out. But I will admit that I didn't consciously base today's sermon uh, on the Sabbath school lesson. But nonetheless, here we are. And we're going to look at the famine that took place in Egypt in Joseph's day. I believe there are some important lessons and many parallels that uh, we can recognize. So let's start Genesis chapter 41 and verse number 53. We're going to read through the end of that chapter. Verse 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he says to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Now, in all likelihood, uh, this famine in Egypt thousands of years ago, it may have been literally global, but most likely it was just in that region of the world. And in the mindset of these people, it was the known world, right? We have other examples of this in Bible history. But nonetheless, the Bible does say it was in all countries, all lands. There was nowhere on the face of the earth that this famine was not stretching. And as we draw and tie our parallels with end time events, we know that at the end it will be literally global. And um, <clears throat> this is where we begin our study uh, today. Now, I want to read for you, or we'll get to that in just a moment here, but let's draw a few of those parallels with the book of Revelation, because by the time we get through the story of the famine here in Genesis, the Egyptians have sold themselves, haven't they? And they have sold their possessions, they have sold their land, they've even sold their sons and daughters to Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh ends up in control of everything. And uh, I'm sure you can already see the parallels here in the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation 13, just quickly to set the stage. In Revelation chapter 13, we read about a power. It's called the beast from the sea, and it ends up in control of the earth, doesn't it? In verse 3 of Revelation 13, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and then all the world wondered after the beast. Now, Protestants have understood for many, many years that this power points to the papal power, and um, it did suffer that deadly wound back in 1798, and it's been slowly recovering for a long time. Jump ahead in Revelation 13 to verse number 8. Verse 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So, through a course of tragedies, disasters, crises, coercion, force, bribery, whatever it may be, eventually the Bible says that all of the world will be brought to where they worship this beast power. Now, in the Bible, worship usually means, you know, the actual act of worship, but it can also signify serving somebody, right? Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? And he responds to Satan's demand that Jesus fall down and worship him. He quotes that verse from Deuteronomy, and he says, Thou shalt not serve any other gods. So to serve or obey is the same biblically as worshiping as well. And we can see these parallels. The Egyptians end up serving the king of Egypt. And at the end of time, the world ends up serving the modern-day king. Pharaoh or king of Egypt. Here we have the papal power. And then later in Revelation 13, we have the description of the mark of the beast. It becomes even more explicit, doesn't it? About the measures that will be used to bring the world to this situation. And eventually the, uh, the mark is enforced on people in their right hand or in their forehead. And then there's the death decree. 
that goes along with that. Now, at the same time, God is working to make servants as well. Praise the Lord, right? And in Revelation chapter 7, we have these verses at the beginning of the chapter that talk about the seal of God. And let's just read those. Revelation 7, beginning in verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Have you ever wondered what this world would look like if it weren't for God's holding back the devil's power? And we're beginning to get a much clearer idea of what that will look like, right? Because as the Holy Spirit withdraws from the earth, the devil will have more and more ability to do what he has always wanted to do, which is completely destroy God's creation. Verse 2, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed who? Who gets the seal of God? Is it everybody in the world? No. Is it anyone who has a passing thought, hmm, maybe I'll serve God? It says the servants of God, those that obey Him, right? And we have descriptions in other verses in Revelation about what does it mean to be a servant of God? Revelation 14, verse 12, you know this verse as well, keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. Revelation 12, verse 17, keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's, there are some things that we need to do as well, right? God is the one who seals us. He's the one who saves us. But it's not just a blank check, is it? He's asking us to respond to that work in a certain way. So here's this great conflict at the end of time. And the devil is trying to make servants, and God is trying to make servants. And in the end, it comes down to my choice, doesn't it? And it comes down to your choice, whom we will serve. Now, I read a statement from Desire of Ages a few days ago that has really grabbed my thoughts, and that's why we're doing this study this morning. And I'm sure that um, most of us have seen this statement before. Here's how it begins. This is on page 121. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. You've heard this. You've read this before, right? But I want to keep reading. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. Okay, so here's references to the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 13. And there's a very clear connection here, right? Uh, or there's, I should say there's no question in what is being referred to. These are the final events. Uh, this is the mark of the beast. Uh, we understand those issues deal with a day of worship. And it is at that time that every earthly support will be cut off from those who serve God. We have no idea what that actually means, do we? What that will actually look like and feel like. And uh, God is trying his best to prepare each one of us, individually, in our families, and in our churches, to trust and rely on him completely. Amen. And that's a tough process, at least with me. <laughs> and it's taking God a while. But we need to pray that God will complete that work in each one of us, because we're going to need it if we're going to stand through the end. Now, this part of the statement, I... You know, I've heard, I've read many, many times. It's what follows next that I had never really registered. Let's keep reading. First of all, here's the promise. To the obedient is given the promise. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. By this promise, the children of God will live. And praise God, we have these promises, right? That God will provide, even if it's manna falling from heaven, like he did for the Israelites even if it is ravens bringing Elijah bread, like he did back then. Now, here's the part of the statement that has grabbed me. When the earth shall be wasted with famine, they shall be fed. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Ellen White makes a very direct link between the issues leading up to the mark of the beast 
and a global worldwide famine, one that wastes the entire earth. Here's the conclusion of the statement. To that time of distress, the prophet Habakkuk looked forward, and his words expressed the faith of the church. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Praise the Lord for these promises. But we want to look a little more closely now at this issue of famine uh, that looks like we might be starting to see the beginnings of here in the world, if the Lord doesn't hold things back longer, right? Now, Jesus said something about famine, Matthew 24, verse 7. He talks about some of the signs leading up to the end. He said, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. <clears throat> now, I will admit again that I have always looked at this verse kind of in in two sections. First of all, there's war, right? We get that. We understand that. That's man-made, right? That's humans getting upset at each other. And then the other things that are mentioned, famines and pestilences and earthquakes. And in my mind, I have always kind of separated the war part from the last three because they seem to be more naturally caused. But I want to suggest this morning that all four of these are going to be caused deliberately by mankind. Now again, war, we get that. There's no question there. Let's jump to the end of the list because earthquakes might be the most difficult one for us to wrap our mind around. <clears throat> There's an interesting website here. If you search in the human-induced earthquake database, you can see a map of all of the earthquakes. And I don't know the exact time frame here, but it's fairly recently. These are earthquakes that have been human-induced. And there are many causes for this. A little further down the page, they break it down. I know it's too small to read. Fracking, right? When they pump, was it water? They pump down there and crack the bedrock and so forth. That's the number one cause. That's the yellow bar. And then you have um, mining, water reservoir impoundments, um, conventional oil and gas, geothermal, most of this is related to our efforts to produce energy. And the list goes on. The point is this, that's a lot of earthquakes, isn't it? Now, it is true there is something different between inducing something and directly being able to make it happen, right? <clears throat> and there's people that believe governments can actually cause earthquakes directly. I don't know, we won't get into that. But the point is, it's these increase in earthquakes are partly due to human activity as well. So if that's the case, then could it also be true when we look at those other things in the list, like pestilences and famine? Could humans have a larger role to play in that than perhaps we have thought before? Encyclopedia uh, Pedia Britannica says this, the most common human cause of famine is warfare, and that makes sense. In addition to destroying crops and food supplies, warfare disrupts the distribution of food through the strategic use of siege and blockade tactics and through the incidental destruction of transportation routes and vehicles. Now, this has been true all through history, right? Uh, you can look at the two times that Jerusalem was destroyed. And there was a siege first by the Babylonians back in the Old Testament. And the Bible tells us in 2 Kings that there was a famine in the city uh, and then the famine became so bad that the city finally fell. If you jump forward hundreds of years and we look at Rome's destruction of Jerusalem, same thing happens, right? When you have a siege, there's famine. And uh, honestly, that's a lot of what is causing all of the chatter about famine today, right? There is a war going on. There is a power that is blocking ports and so forth. And it's just the same dynamic on a bigger scale. The Economist said this, the widely accepted idea of a cost of living crisis does not begin to capture the gravity of what may lie ahead. Antonio Guterres, the Union Secretary, UN Secretary General, warned on May 18th, that's this year, that the coming months threaten the specter of a global food shortage that could last for years. The high cost of staple foods has already raised the number of people who cannot be sure of getting enough to eat by 440 million 
to 1.6 billion. That's a pretty large percentage of the Earth's population, isn't it? Nearly 250 million are on the brink of famine. If, as is likely, the war drags on and supplies from Russia and Ukraine are limited, hundreds of millions more could fall into poverty. Political unrest will spread, children will be stunted, and people will starve. Now, Britannica goes on to talk about the deliberate destruction of crops and food supplies and how it became a common tactic of war in the 19th century, employed by both attacking and defending armies. That's kind of interesting, right? Then they cite this example. The scorched earth policy adopted by the Russians in 1812 not only deprived Napoleon's armies of needed food, but also starved the Russian people who depended on the land. And can you imagine a government that would sacrifice its own people? Well, it's not as hard to imagine now, maybe, as it was a few years ago. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 47. We realize we're facing this crisis. We don't know exactly how quickly it will get worse or to what extent it will go, but we do have prophetic warnings that the earth will be wasted with famine at the time that the mark of the beast is implemented. And when you think that through, it does kind of make sense, doesn't it? I mean, people are willing to give up a lot in order to have food security and to get the next meal on the table. So what would lead the world to accept the mark of the beast? Well, a food crisis would be an awfully good way to try to get that to happen. So here we go back to Genesis chapter 47. We're going to just walk our way through the Bible's description of this famine, beginning in Genesis 47, verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. All right, so this was a severe famine. Now, I uh, highlighted the word fainted there. I was curious what the Hebrew was, and the Hebrew word is laha. It's a primitive root meaning to burn or by implication to be rabid. Now, when someone is dehydrating or almost on the brink of death from starvation, begin to hallucinate, that's a good description, right? We, we can lose our mind in those last stages of starvation or hydration. And so this is what's happening to Egypt, probably both literally and figuratively as well. Um, people begin to go lose their mind, right? Uh, and in this sense, we can understand that. What would cause people to sell everything they own to the government? To give up all of their personal property, their lands, even themselves and their children? What would cause people to even violate their own conscience in regards to the mark of the beast? It's a battle of the mind, isn't it? And we see it illustrated here in the story in Genesis. Now, this specific Hebrew word, laha, only occurs two times in the Bible. One is right here in Genesis, and the second time is in this verse in Proverbs, chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. As a mad or laha man who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that what? Deceives his neighbor and says, am I not in sport? Now, Jesus warned about deception at the end of time, didn't he? Revelation warns about deception. And here we have this interesting verse in Proverbs about a mad man who deceives his neighbor. And um, the Bible says something, doesn't it, about the wine of Babylon at the end of time that deceives people, ultimately into receiving the mark of the beast. And the world will, in a sense, lose its mind. It will lose its ability to judge correctly, to think clearly, certainly to think biblically. It will lose its ability to recognize cause and effect. And again, we see it illustrated in the famine of Egypt. Now, I want to dive just a moment, a little bit deeper into Matthew 24, because Jesus talks about the issue at the very end, and he phrases it as the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. That's not a command to the disciples. That's a description of where the abomination of desolation is going to occur. Something is going to stand in the holy place. 
And then probably Matthew includes this little parenthetical statement, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So in Matthew 24, or for that matter, anywhere in the Gospels, Jesus never says the words, Mark of the Beast. That's only in Revelation. But he does talk about the abomination of desolation, this prophetic event that we first find in the book of Daniel. So we want to look a little more closely at this abomination of desolation. There are three applications. Uh, sometimes we talk about a dual application of prophecy. This one actually has three times that it will be fulfilled. First time was literally in the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. And um, <clears throat> the second time is spiritually and regionally. That's the Middle Ages. We'll look at that in a moment. And the third time will be spiritually but globally at the very end of time. Now we read in the great controversy about the first application when this was literally fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. Great controversy, page 25. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. So what was the abomination of desolation that Jesus warns about? It has to do with the Romans. And it has to do with their standards being planted in the holy ground. Okay, so that might make us ask the question, what then is a standard? And the old meaning is a little different than the way we usually use the word today. Uh, the a standard was the distinctive ensign or emblem of a monarch, noble, or commander of a nation or city, especially displayed in battle or in a ceremonial context as a means of identification. Now, we're going to kind of see this fleshed out in just a moment. Figuratively, it's a rallying point for a group of followers or an object of allegiance. So it's something around which people gather. They identify together because of that. And it's also at the same time something used in warfare as a semblance of um, who's in control. Now, Jesus said that this standard or this desolation of abomination would stand in the holy place. And it's interesting when we look in the Bible, the Bible identifies many things as holy. I'm not talking about people, I'm not talking about God or how we should be holy. I'm talking about things. Here's a list. The holy land, right? We st still use that phrase today. And the holy land, of course, is that promised land over there uh, in Palestine. What makes the Holy Land holy? Well, there's a holy city in the Holy Land. That's Jerusalem. And so the Bible refers to Jerusalem as the holy city. And of course, when the Romans attacked and besieged Jerusalem, they were encamped around that holy city in the Holy Land. What made Jerusalem holy? Was it the walls? Was it the gates? Was it the wells that they had dug in the city? Were those holy wells? It was the temple, wasn't it? And so the temple not only made the city, but even the grounds around it holy. And for the sake of time, I'm not reading all these verses, but Ezekiel 43, verse 12, let's actually go there because this uh, ties in with the statement in Great Controversy. Ezekiel 43, verse 12. <clears throat> now this is part of Ezekiel's vision of the temple that was never actually built uh, or rebuilt after the return of the Jews. But here is what he says about this temple. Ezekiel 43, verse 12, this is the law of the house or the temple. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. So the temple not only sanctified or made holy, it's immediate, you know, the temple mount area, not even the city itself, but actually the surrounding area on that whole mountain was considered holy. So when the Romans came and planted their standards with their pagan gods on the hills surrounding Jerusalem, it literally was holy ground. Now the Bible um, talks a lot about how holy things were to be connected with the temple. If you read through the book of Leviticus, uh, what is it, 92 times in 77 verses, the word holy appears just in the book of Leviticus, 
which is totally focused on the, the sanctuary and its services. Let's keep zeroing in a little bit more. There were a couple of rooms inside the tabernacle, weren't they? What were they called? Holy place and the most holy, most holy place. And then what was inside the most holy place? What made it so sacred? There was the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. And what was in the, lock, uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant? The law, which Paul says is holy and just and good. So we come all the way down to the law of God being in the heart of the, the most holy place, being in the heart of the temple, being in the middle of the city, making the holy land holy, right? And let's go one step further. Which commandment contains the word holy? It's the fourth commandment, isn't it? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the Bible says an awful lot about what is holy. And it brings us all the way down to the Sabbath. Now, in the second application of what Jesus uh, says about the, the abomination of desolation, first one was literal, historic. The second one is figurative. It's also historic, but it's regional. And we look in the Middle Ages as Christianity uh, apostatized and then compromised with uh, the pagan religions around it. We know there were compromises made. And it was the Sunday issue, right? Above all others, when Constantine brought in sun worship, tried to meld it with Christianity, and we end up with those Sunday laws originating from Constantine. And it's interesting that even today, that papal power points to Sunday as the sign of its authority, doesn't it? Here's just one example statement from the Catholic record. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. So if you have any questions about who's in charge, just look at our standard. Look at this day that we have changed. We have made it holy. Deny the authority of the church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Now, in the third application of the prophecy where it is figurative again. So it's going to be the same issue. It's Sabbath and Sunday issue. But now it's going to be global in scope. Revelation 13 tells us that all the world will wonder after the beast. In other words, people will not be able to think clearly. Right? They will be like madmen, not thinking through the issues biblically. Mm. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 464. <clears throat> says, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. All right, so there's no question about where things are headed. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, instead of seeking expensive dwellings here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Instead of spending our means in self-gratification, we should be studying to economize. One last statement in this respect, then we'll move forward with the story in Genesis. Let's go back to the original siege, or that siege by the Romans around Jerusalem. What happened inside of Jerusalem during that siege. And we're going to see four things. Then we're going to ask, do, are we seeing these four things happening today? Terrible were the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. All the horrors of starvation were experienced. A measure of wheat was sold for a talent. Famine and pest, or thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affections seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands rob their wives and wives their husbands. You can actually read in the great controversy in the paragraphs that follow how parents were eating their children, right? Horrible cannibalism going on inside the city. But here's four things that happened under the Roman siege. First of all, runaway inflation. A measure of wheat sold for a talent. Are we seeing that yes. happening in the world right now? Okay. Then there's famine. There's a lot of concern about that. How about pestilence? Do we have pestilence in the world? 
we do. And then natural affection seems to have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Violence in society, violence within families. Are we seeing this as well? Mm -hmm. So I'd ask this question, could it be possible that we are in a Roman siege? Mm -hmm. The world as a whole. And where is it headed? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 47. <clears throat> and we're going to start in verse 14. Let's look at what happened back in Joseph's day during that famine. We'll read verses 14 and 15. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Mm -hmm. Now, is there also concern today about the economic situation? Of course there is. There's a lot of talk about our current systems of currency essentially failing. And governments are now looking for a better solution. And uh, we've looked at some of those things in the past, right? Digital currencies, things like this, right? So this is all on the table as well right now. Verse 16, and Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for asses. And he fed them with the bread for all their cattle for that year. So they begin selling their personal property, right? Because they have no more money that works. The only thing left are now the hard assets. And they start selling their livestock. That was, that was one year. Here's what happens the next year. Verse 18. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also had our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. So you know what's going to follow, right? First, you're going to sell your land. You're going to keep your body for last, hoping that you don't have to sell that. Verse 19, Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Now, if you're Pharaoh, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Because you know you've got your little stash on the side. You're going to be fine no matter what happens. But Pharaoh ends up in control legally, right? He owns everything. Interesting statement here from the Bible commentary talking about this. The kings of Egypt enjoyed sole possession of all non-ecclesiastical properties after the expulsion of the Hyksos. Now, if we jumped, we'll come back to the statement here in just a moment. In verse 22 of Genesis 47, it mentions a religious exemption. I'll, I'll use that term. Not everybody has to sell their land and their property. There is one class that doesn't. Let's read that, Genesis 47, verse 22. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. So Pharaoh is in cahoots with the priests, right? There is a church-state alliance here. And when you dive into the history, the priests actually were the most powerful class within Egypt, in some ways more powerful than the pharaohs. And the pharaohs did not willingly cross the priests. They did everything they could to keep them happy, to keep them satisfied. Even Joseph uh, recognizes that political situation, and so he doesn't force the issue either. He just he kind of goes along with this. The priests were extremely powerful. And so when everyone else has sold their land, they end up as the most powerful class in society. Do we see parallels mm -hmm. with Revelation in the end of time? Now let's go back to the statement here. The kings of Egypt enjoyed sole possession of all non-ecclesiastical properties after the expulsion of the Hyksos. Now the Hyksos were uh, probably Semitic or from that part of the world they had invaded Egypt for a time, and most likely that is when Joseph and his family moved into Egypt. 
And that's why Joseph was so readily accepted by Pharaoh, and his family was accepted as well. Eventually, they were pushed back out of Egypt by the Egyptians, and that's when the Hebrews were brought into slavery, because in the Egyptians' mind, they were part of these Hyksos that they had just expelled. Here's the point. Before the Hyksos came in charge or uh, had control of Egypt, Egypt, uh, the Egyptians had personal property. It was a very different societal structure. So something changes here. Look down at the next bold face portion. When that period ended and the monuments began to shed light on the existing situation once more, it is found that all lands and practically all the other property of Egypt had become the monopoly of the crown and the priesthood. The best explanation for this radical change in the social structure of the nation is the biblical record of Joseph's administrative measures during the seven years of famine. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a power that would like to have possession of everything in this world? And are we headed there? Interesting little video, and I just did some screenshots of it. This is from a few years ago from the World Economic Forum, and they're giving eight predictions for the world in the year 2030. And the very first prediction is this, that you will own nothing and you'll be happy about it. Wow. Now, I've been thinking this through. <clears throat> <laughs> and I'll just say for me, I don't know if I'd be too happy if I lost control of everything, right? Now, we understand that eventually that'll happen. If, if, if I'm faithful to God, if you're faithful to God, eventually we have to kiss everything goodbye. Mm -hmm. But it, it's still not going to be a fun process. So how would you be happy about it? Well, what made the Egyptians happy to give all their possessions to Pharaoh? Only a crisis severe enough that if they didn't do it, they would die, Right? So, are we looking at a crisis developing in our world that will bring the entire world to the place where the Egyptians were? Where they realize, if we do not give all of this up and hand it over, we're going to perish. Mm -hmm. Genesis 47, verse 23. Just a little more description of what goes on here. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. So the people don't have to move off their land, right? They get to stay there, but they're no longer the owners. They're just working the land. And now they have to pay tax on it. It shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. <laughs> now who enjoys taxes 20% tax <laughs> the government enjoys taxes but so did the Egyptians look at verse 25 and they said you have saved our lives let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants again only if you don't go along with it, you're guaranteed to perish. That is the only reason you could be happy about this kind of situation. And so we see in ancient Egypt kind of a feudal system, right? Or the sharecropping thing that we also saw in the Middle Ages when the church owned everything. The church owns the property or the state owns the property. You can live on it. You can work it. You can do the work for us and you can give us a nice return on it and the rest you can keep for yourselves. And I believe that's where the world is leaning once again. How quickly we get there remains to be seen. <clears throat> Turn with me to Revelation chapter 18. Now, I'm so glad for the Bible's prophecies. <laughs> if it weren't for what the Bible tells us, it could get pretty discouraging, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. But the Bible tells us that eventually all of this comes crashing down and Jesus comes back and he sets everything right. So in Revelation 18, we have a description of Babylon's collapse, its fall. And I just want to look at three of the verses, verses 11, 12, and 13, as they talk about um, Babylon's fall. So verse 11, The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. 
And now it's going to explain the merchandise. And I want you to notice the progression of what, I believe this is a progression of what people will surrender in order to survive. And it's kind of the same progression that we saw in our story in Genesis. Verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. Now, if we were to pick one word to just kind of describe all of those things in verse 12, what word might you pick? Tangible, Tangible items, absolutely. They're also luxury items, aren't they? Do you have to have gold? Unless it represents money, right? But do you have to have gold lying around in your house to survive? How about fine linen and purple and silk? Right? These are luxury items. And so these are the first things that we will give up by necessity. But then it goes on, verse 13. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat. We're hearing a lot about wheat right now, right? Here's the food supply. So once we've given up our luxuries, now we come down to the basic necessities. But they're still tangible items. The list goes on. After wheat, we have beasts and sheep and horses and chariots. Now this is modes of transportation. One of the aspects of a free society is the ability to travel freely, to assemble together freely. That's why we're gathered here this morning. Eventually, that can go as well. So the ability to move yourself from place to place. And then at the end of verse 13, it talks about slaves and the souls of men. The last thing to go is your integrity, your conscience, your choice of whom you will serve. And again, the Bible says people will receive the mark of the beast either in the forehead or in the hand. And those that receive it in the hand are those that consciously go against their conscience. We know this isn't right. I know this is not what the Bible says or it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to do it anyways because if I don't, I won't have bread. That's trading your soul to Babylon. And it all comes crashing down. Now, let's end by looking at some good news, right? Let's look at what Joseph did for his family during this time. Go back to Genesis chapter 47. And we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. What did Joseph do for his family? Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. In the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Now we know it was in the land of Goshen. We find that in uh, verse 1 of chapter 47. Where was Goshen? Well, it was kind of in the northeastern part of Egypt. We're not exactly sure. You can read different ideas of exactly where it was. But it was in an area suitable for shepherds, right? Because Joseph's family were shepherds. And he actually advised them to tell Pharaoh when they got to Egypt, we are shepherds. And uh, there was a reason that Joseph did that. He didn't want them to be possibly brought into court life. It would have been reasonable for Pharaoh to think, well, if Joseph helped me this much, maybe his brothers would help me too. Why don't you all take positions at court? And knowing their character, Joseph knew that would have been a death sentence for his brothers. They would have never survived those temptations. And so he said, probably with a little hidden smile, tell them you're shepherds. And he knew that if they told Pharaoh that, that they would be basically segregated because the Egyptians were not real fond of shepherds. Look at verse, uh, chapter 46, verse 34. Last, last verse of chapter 46. Joseph says, tell them, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now. That's all we know about. We can't do anything else. We're wonderful shepherds, but we have no skills anywhere else. Both we and also our fathers, that we, may, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Joseph wanted the Israelites, you know, his family, to have some separation from the rest of the people there. Interesting comment here in the commentary again. 
These words the, about the abomination of the Egyptians, they are probably not the words of Joseph, but of Moses, the historian. Moses' evaluation of the Egyptian attitude toward shepherds is corroborated later by Greek writers and by Josephus, as earlier by pictorial representations in paintings and reliefs. Now, this is interesting. Shepherds are frequently represented as miserable creatures, dirty and unshaven, naked and half-starved, and often either lame or deformed. In other words, if you were a shepherd in Egypt, you were the outcast of society, right? You had no skills that would benefit society, so just go take care of the animals. Now, at the end of time, for those who choose to remain loyal to God, how will the rest of the world think about you? Same way, right? Miserable creatures, not fit for participation in society. Just shove them off and eventually kill them because they're, they're useless for society. Goshen. What does Goshen mean? It means drawing near. And Joseph draws his family near to him, doesn't he? He's the one that invites his family to come to Egypt and to live in this land of Goshen. And Joseph is a type of Christ. He is the one that provides for his family in a time of crisis. Just like Jesus has promised, he will provide for his people in the great crisis at the end of time. I want to close today by asking a question. What should we do now? Right, this can't just be a news report. <laughs> you can get that online. What should we do now to prepare and to be ready? So I have just a few short things here. Number one, we should accustom ourselves to a simple diet. Mm -hmm. Now, this is practical. The first two are very practical mm -hmm. that we're advised to do. If we know that the world is going to be wasted with famine and the little Debbie truck's not going to be running. <laughs> Sorry, little Debbie. Right? How, what, how should we be preparing for that? One very practical way is to begin accustoming acclimating our taste buds, I'll say it that way, mm -hmm. to a more simple kind of diet. God promises to provide for his people, but what does he promise? Bread and water. Mm -hmm. right? Nothing more than that, but he does promise that. The time of trouble is just before us, and then stern necessity will require the people of God to deny self and to eat merely enough to sustain life. Mm -hmm. But God will prepare us for that time. In that fearful hour, our necessity will be God's opportunity to impart his strengthening power and to sustain his people. So that's one practical thing that we can do. Not easy, is it? But it is something that takes time. Here's a second thing that we can do, and that is to heed inspired calls to move out of the city. We know destruction is coming on the largest cities first. And um, you look through the Bible, <clears throat> when Babylon calls in Revelation 14, 8, God calls his people out of that falling city. Jesus gave his disciples counsel to flee from Jerusalem when they saw the armies laid siege about. Those were practical instructions <laughs> that they needed to do. So what about for us today? This is Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 141. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Mm. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again, get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. Mm. Practical advice. And I can tell you from personal experience, it's not like you just buy a house in the country and then you start growing your own food. <laughs> I kind of had that idea, and I've since realized that, actually, Stacy and I have talked a lot about this, and we're convinced that the biggest reason, the most important reason that God asks us to do this is so we learn dependence on Him. Because I have realized for several years now, I cannot grow enough food. <laughs> it doesn't matter what size garden I have. Even if I lay it out there, the bugs are going to get it or the hail is going to get it. We have to learn self-dependence. 
And if we are doing our best to do what God has asked us, he'll fill in the gaps and he'll provide the rest. But here's the counsel we've been given. Now, the last three pieces of advice are more spiritual in nature. The first one is simply this. We need to study the word of God and Bible prophecy. We need to understand what's happening. You know, Peter, uh, in 2 Peter 1.19, he talks about prophecy being a light. Right? We need that light. The world's getting darker and darker. So we need to understand what's coming so that we know how to act. And that's what Joseph did, right? I mean, he received the dream from God. Most of us probably will not get that direct vision or that dream from God, but we have it here, and we have it in the spirit of prophecy. And then Joseph took action based on that dream that Pharaoh had received. And many people were saved as a result. Number four, what can we do now? We need to become settled into the truth. I read this statement last week. I'm going to read it again. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Amen. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. So God is not waiting on anything out there, right? Even anything coming from Rome. God is waiting on me and you to get settled into the truth so that we cannot be moved even by the earth being wasted with famine, even by the prospect of starvation. I know my God. I know his character. I know that he loves me. I know that he actually wants the very best for me, and I'm willing to trust him no matter what. That is being sealed so we cannot be moved. And when that has happened, then the end will come. Finally, and this is from Revelation 14, verse 12, we need to learn how to live by faith. Mm -hmm. Right? The saints are described as having the faith of Jesus. And God gives us opportunities every single day, at least he does for me, and I'm guessing he does for you as well, on how to live by faith. So I want to leave you with this challenge here on the faith thought. Whatever there is in your life right now that you're dealing with, that you're struggling with, that you don't see the way through or the answer to, take it to God and ask him to show you what to do. Maybe it means to just sit and wait and keep praying. Maybe it means to do this or to do that. Whatever his answer is, take that and run with it. Because we must learn how to live by faith. And I'm convinced that that time frame where I have to learn is getting shorter and shorter, a lot quicker than we realize, right? Yeah. But God's showing us just enough of what's happening so we can recognize the urgency, recognize our need of this experience, and make that decision. I will trust you. I will follow you no matter what. My life is in your hands. You gave me life in the first place. I didn't spring myself into being, Lord. So I'm your problem. You brought me here. Now you provide for me, you sustain me, and I'll praise you and I'll do my best with your help to live a life that glorifies you. That's all God is asking for, and he promises to do the rest. If it's your desire to have that experience, I'd invite you to stand as we sing our closing song together, It Is Well With My Soul. We need that experience, don't we? No matter what happens, you know, the author of this hymn lost his family in a shipwreck. And his response was to sit down and pen these words. It is well with my soul. We need that kind of faith. And God promises we can have it. Let's sing together.